ignores the past um, is, is, is someone who is not going to know what's going to happen in the future. And this, is, this was recorded for us so that we wouldn't make the same mistakes that they made. And unfortunately, uh, you know, well, trying to figure out how to repair your atmosphere and stuff like that. Sounds like we're pretty much already there, doesn't it? My life since has returned to me as if awakened from the deepest sleep by the sound of the calling of my name. I was in some kind of an enclosure. It was dark, but there was also an aura. Then my name was called again by the deepest of voices, and although I could hear it, I could not tell whence the voice came, nor could I see whoever it was that spoke, and I said, here I am. Oh, wait, I've already read this. Did we get our page thrown off here? Yeah, I did. Well, I don't remember what page we left off on. Well, it stinks. Let me just uh, scroll through the page. Bear with me for a minute. Oh, here we go. Yeah, because this is, yeah, we were way past that. Uh, yeah, this is basically continuing on the uh, the sort of genealogical history of uh, the the ancestors of the Anunnaki who came who came to Earth and seeded life on on Earth and and so this is their uh, their historical and genealogical record here. Try to see how much of this we read. Um, it's talking essentially about how, uh, we, we, there was great cataclysms, there was nuclear weapons unleashed, um, uh, and then somehow, you know, it, it was just interesting because after, you know, they said brother was pitted against brother and then all of their, uh, people on their planet were wiped out and then out of those ashes like the phoenix out of the ashes which is interesting because that's one of the symbols of the brotherhood the double headed uh double headed phoenix um you know, arose these bloodlines and these kings and queens and set up the new game and so here they're talking about the circuit of nibiru which is the orbit of nibiru a destiny it is in the orbit of nibiru embedded so they're saying that there's, you know, the, the destiny of what's to happen on their planet and our planet is hidden in the orbit of Nibiru. And many people out there uh, believe that this comet Elenin, which is going to pass near to Earth very soon, is actually the famed Nibiru. I don't really believe that myself, but uh, I don't not believe it either. You know what I mean? I'm just sort of uh, go either way. Others of knowledge of the orbit um, did not consider the Nibiru's destiny destiny to be tied with that orbit. Um, they found that there had there was a breaching in their atmosphere. Volcanoes, the atmosphere uh, were, were, were belching and spitting up. I'm sort of you know as I was doing Friday, and I'm sort of kind of going over some of this stuff is in kind of a weird. It doesn't really translate well in modern-day English, so I'm kind of just kind of uh, s summarizing it all for you because it just sounds dumb to read. Volcanoes, the atmosphere forbear. Less belching, we're spitting up. I'd rather just say there were volcanoes and shit was coming out of them, you know. <laughs> Nibiru's air ha uh, has been made thinner. Uh, the protective shit lid has been diminished. I think it's supposed to say shield. But it says shit lid. Is that what they call it in ancient Samaria? The shit lid? Yeah, get that shit lid up there, boy, before we burn to death. Ah, right, damn, put some duct tape and some bailing wire on it. Do whatever you got to do. Keep us from burning up. I think Bill Hooks was right. We've been invaded by rednecks from another world. 
In the reign of Anshar and Kishar, pestilences uh, appeared, and, and they could not overcome them. Their son, Inshar, ascended to the throne, and uh, he was the, of the sixth dynasty of rule on Nibiru. His uh, name became Master of the Shar. Uh, with great understanding, he was born. So he was, when he was born, he was already, you know, very, he already had knowledge when he was born. He was born with a great knowledge of something. With much learning, he mastered much knowledge. To remedy the affliction, uh, afflictions in the ways he sought to uh, remedy the afflictions of people, and uh, he spent much time studying the orbit of Nibiru. In its looping of the sun, five family members embraced pl the planets of dazzling beauty for cures to the afflictions or atmosphere. Uh, he examined the atmosphere, so they so. They were finding out that people were dying on their planet, and the reason that was was because of their atmosphere being depleted. To each, he gave a name. Ancestral forefathers he honored as heavenly couples he considered them. On and on to were like twin planets. He called the first two that he encountered on and on to. Beyond Nibiru's orbit were Anshar and Kishar. And they were the largest in size. As a messenger, Gaga, among the others, course, sometimes first to Nibiru meet. I think Gaga is Jupiter or Saturn or one of those. So there, there's your occultic reference in your occultic uh, explanation behind Lady Gaga. Oh, you didn't know that? Yeah, that's where they came from. It's, it's all, I mean, come on. She's Italian, too. Give me a fucking break. These, these guys in the priest class so that, that run the music industry and all this, they, they're all well aware of this stuff. I mean, every one of her videos, Lady Gaga's videos, one of her first videos, there's, you know, Sirius in the background to the twin dogs. I mean, there's occultic stuff in every single one of those. That's not there by mistake. And it's not put there by her, either. Don't, don't, don't confuse that, you know. Um, the, 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 most of the time, the guys that, in the A&R departments at the major record labels are the ones that are the occultists and are into this. And, you know, they suggest, hey, you should put this in there. And they say, oh, okay, cool, whatever you want, you know, yay. Give me some more Coke and a million dollars. I'll do whatever you want. Five in all were Nibiru's heavenly greeters as the sun it circled. Beyond, like a boundary, the hammered bracelet of the sun encircled. As a guardian of the heavens, forbidden region with havoc, it protected. Other children of the sun, four in number from intrusion, the bracelet shielded. The atmospheres of the great five greeters, Inchar, set out to study. So some sort of um, loop, which interesting, because I've just had this story here tonight and I already closed out of it, damn it. Let me see if I can get back to it. Um, that's, just, uh, that's just odd that it's talking about this. Uh, bracelet that came from the sun that actually protected part of their atmosphere during the time in which it came around. And I had this story here tonight, and I didn't cover it, and I was thinking, no, oh, no, I, I'll just skip that one. Here it is. Kind of seems synchronistic now. It, maybe there's a connection to this. It says, it's from the Daily Mail, uh, discovery of magnetic ropes that cause solar storms will pre help prepare Earth for space weather damage. So they discovered these ropes that precede uh, these solar flares, which should be able to, to help us be able to understand when these are going to happen and protect against them. And I'll put a link to that in the chat room so you can check it out on your own, but it just seems... Um, Highly coincidental and seems almost very similar to what they're describing here as this. Uh, maybe it was something about these ropes, as they're calling here in this Daily Mail article. Maybe that's what the bracelet was. You know, shielding the planet. In its repeating orbit, the five in Nibiru's loop carefully were examined. The five planets in the same orbit as Nibiru were carefully examined. 
Um, they observed what types of atmospheres that these planets possessed. And with celestial chariots, they intensely were examined. Oh, right. So they sent spaceships to examine the, the, the planets closer. That's what it is, celestial chariots. Come on. The findings were astounding. The discoveries confusing. From orbit to orbit, Nibiru's atmosphere uh, seemed to have more breaching. And the councils of the learned cures were avidly debated. Ways to bandage the wound were urgently considered. A new shield to embrace the planet was attempted. All that was thrust up back to the ground came down. And the councils of the learned, the belching volcanoes were studied. The atmosphere by belching volcanoes uh, that were created by the uh, volcanoes. Well, God, I'm just trying to figure out a way to say this. The atmosphere by belching volcanoes had been created as wound by their diminished belching had come to be. And it just doesn't, you know. So these volcanoes cause their atmosphere um, were one of the causes of their atmosphere to be depleted. Uh, and uh, it says here that they basically figured out how to make a new invention that would utilize the volcanoes to basically solve their problem. And so they were, were actually trying to get the volcanoes to keep spewing, even though they wanted them to stop before. Now they were hoping that the volcanoes would start to spew again because whatever uh, solution they come up with needed that to, uh, to uh, happen in order for it to work. In the reign of Inshar, the breach in the skies grew bigger. Um, it didn't rain. The wind blew harder. And uh, there was no water that came out of the ground. In the lands, there was an accusation the breasts of mothers were dry. In the palace, there was distress. And an accusation therein took hold, as first his wife, Inshar, a half-sister, did espouse by the law of the seed abiding. Ninshar, she was called, who bears the shars of the lady, a son she did not bear. By a concubine to Inshar, a son was born, the firstborn son he was. By Ninshar, first wife and half-sister, a son was not brought forth. By the law of secession, the concubine's son to the throne ascended. The seventh to reign he was, Du Uro was his royal name, and the dwelling place fashioned its meaning in the house of concubines, not in the palace he was indeed conceived. So he was like, you know, he was like the George Bush of his time, I suppose, now, you know. <laughs> the, the, the bastard son who ascended to power, the, you know, the more like the, actually the Bill Clinton of his time, huh? Yeah. I don't know if they still know who Bill Clinton's dad was. His mom was a Dirty, dirty whore. Damn, man. She fucked so many dudes. They didn't know who the fuck Bill's dad was. I think somebody said it was oh, that guy from Hee Haw. Junior Samples or some shit like that. I think somebody said Junior Samples was his dad. And somebody at Dilly Plaza, Plaza told me that one time. <laughs> As his spouse, a maiden from his youth, beloved Duru, Duru chose. And, uh, oh, that, that's interesting. So, uh, Duru, the bastard son who took over power, chose his wife because he loved her, not because she was in the bloodline. Uh oh. Well, this is interesting, man. This is this this is this story starting to get thick. Now we're starting to see why you know we need to learn this. This sounds very similar to the you know the history of some of our kings and queens and power structure on Earth, doesn't it? Da Uru was her royal name. She who was by my side was the meaning. Wow, that's kind of a down uh, a downgrade from, you know, the wife before. What was she was like, you know, the one who does something in the sky. This is like, you know, the bitch who the bitch who stands by my side all the time. Wow, that's just beautiful, man. Wonderful, wonderful poetry there. <laughs> in the royal court, confusion was rampant. Sons were not heirs. Wives were not half sisters. In the land, the suffering was increasing. Fields uh, had no abundance. The plants wouldn't grow. And uh, among the people, fertility was diminished. I mean, you know, 
nobody uh, was getting pregnant means nobody was being born, so their population was uh, diminishing fast. In the palace, fertility was absent. Neither son nor daughter was brought forth. Of On's seed, seven were the rulers. Then of his seed, the throne was dry. So On, which is funny because On is, if you know, the, the if you study the genealogical history of the Anunnaki, On was, you know, the Anunnaki were, were the, the, or the Anunnaki were the princes of, you know, the one God. Princes of, of, of the, the guy who, they were the he was the son the forefathers they were the forefathers of you know the the one who was the first person that started the bloodline and that was on and so after seven uh, of on's bloodline were the rulers they no longer had one of on's bloodline in rule daru a child at the palace gateway uh, was embraced as a son Duru, in the end, uh, was adopted. His name became Lama, meaning dryness. In the palace, the princes were, were very mad, and they were complaining to the council of counselors. In the end, Lama ascended the throne. Though not of on seed, he was the eighth to reign. Now, that's very interesting. He sounds very much like a... Uh, Akhenaten type character, you know. In the councils of the learned to heal the breach, there were two suggestions. One was to use a metal to fix their atmosphere, uh, a metal by the name of gold. On the biru, it was greatly rare. Within the hammered bracelet, it was abundant. So the zone, I guess, the hammered bracelet may be very well talking about the uh, asteroid belt. It was the only substance that to the finest powder could be ground up and uh, put in high into the heaven, into the atmosphere, and, and would stay suspended. Thus, with replenishments, the breach would heal and uh, it would have better protection. Let the celestial boats be built. Let a celestial fleet to the to fleet the gold to Nibiru bring over. So they're here they are talking about let's create ships and go somewhere out, you know, on the other side of our solar system and find some gold and bring it back here. Funny, that would just be the one thing our monetary system just happened to be based on, huh? You know, get us all to mine it, get us all to build our whole, you know, fight and kill each other for you know, 3,500 years or 3,600 years or however long it is, you know. And then uh, create this power structure, then get everybody to hoard it in one spot. And then when they get to come, when the Anunnaki come back and tell us, Pathetic earthlings, bow down to me. We are the Anunnaki and we have returned for our gold. We will take it back to our planet and leave you pathetic earthlings here on the planet to die. You know. Stranger things have happened. Probably what it's going to be, isn't it? Folks, you're going to have to get this gold right now, folks, because I don't know if you want to take the gold away from you, folks. Ted's got a great deal on Jugo for you today, and uh, you need to get it now because uh, you don't have much, much time left, folks. You don't know if you're going to take your gold, folks. And I'm fucking mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll probably hear that before it's over with. Let. Weapons of terror be created. Now, we've um, established in uh, from reading William Bramley and reading the rest of this that the weapons of terror they refer to are the uh, uh, nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction. So they're saying they should, you know, go to this planet or wherever it is and just launch nuclear weapons and blow the shit out of stuff and go in and pick up all the gold. For a decision, Lama was too feeble. What uh, what did he know about making that kind of a choice? One circuit, once uh, orbit of Nibiru was completed, in the fields, affliction was was not diminished. The volcanoes be continued belching, and the atmosphere was still not repaired. A third shar passed. A fourth was a shar is a year. 
uh, in Nibiru, by the way, it's a, it's a uh, marking of a, or a year or marking of a, a sort of passage of time. So when they say a third char passed and a fourth char passed, that's a, a, a notation of time, by the way. Uh, still, the gold was not obtained. In the land, uh, there was still strife. Strife was abundant. There was no food, no water. Uh, nobody, everybody in the uh, in the lands were disjointed. Everybody was accusing each other. Uh, everybody's running around like basically like a chicken with their head cut off, not knowing who to blame, playing the blame game. Um, and there's basically saying, well, then if if this is our destiny to die like this, then uh, you know. Uh, Doing or, or, or we can't really do anything about it. In the royal court, the princes were astir. The king's accusations were directed foolishly, unreasoning, and greater calamities instead of the cure he brought forth. From the olden storehouses, weapons were retrieved. A rebellion. There was much speaking. A prince in the royal palace was the first to take up arms, and now they they're having civil unrest. And uh, they went up to uh, Lama and uh, attacked him. And uh, they killed Lama, the, the eighth ruler. He, he, uh, Lama is no more. The king is no more, with glee, he announced. To the throne room, Alalu rushed. On the throne, he himself seated. Without right or counsel, a king, he pronounced himself king. In the land, all unity was lost. Some rejoiced the death of Lama. Some were saddened by it. Now this is the account of the kingship of Alalu and of the going to earth. So when this guy, so what's, essentially what they're telling us is that this guy Lama died, and this guy Alalu, who just, you know, wasn't anybody, basically came in and said, you know, I'm not of the bloodline. I'm, not, I'm just a regular person. I'm taking over. And now that I'm taking over and I'm the new game in town, I'm, I'm saying that we're going to Earth and we're going to go get the gold there. So there was no talk of going to Earth and mining Earth. That's interesting. Um, by the power structure of people that existed on the throne in Nibiru, there was no talk of even going to Earth to do this until this usurper came in and basically took over the throne by, you know, sheer brute force. He came in, killed the king, took over and became king and said, we're going to Earth to get the gold to fix this problem. That's very interesting. This is why they say that the Anunnaki, the people that came to Earth and did the things that they did and created humans and all this stuff, were um, pursued from some of the other inhabitants of, of, of Nibiru. By, they were pursued by other Anunnaki. So that, that, that kind of clears that, that, that up a little bit, doesn't it? So it wasn't that we were even, you know, invaded or genetically manipulated by people who were, you know, of the royal bloodline. We were, these were basically usurpers. We were, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of an unbelievable thing. In the land, uh, the unity was lost. And uh, many people did not did not like the kingship of this guy, Alala, just coming in and saying, I'm taking over. I'm the new game in town. You can imagine that. Uh Princes were agitated. The council counselors were distraught. From father to son, secession from on to the throne continued. Even Lama the Eighth, by adoption, a son was proclaimed. Who was Alalu? Was he a legal heir? Was he a firstborn? By what right did he usurp? Was he not a king slayer? Before the seven who judge Alalu was summoned, his fate to consider. Um, so they're bringing into him to be judged by seven people. Um, though through ne neither legal heir nor son of a firstborn royal seed, he wa uh, was he. Of Ang Shargal, I am descended before the judges he claimed by a concubine. My ancestor was born to him. Alam was his name. By the count of Shars, by the count of years, Alam was the firstborn throne to belong to him. So basically, he he came in and uh, 
said, no, I can prove that I am part of this bloodline. So they couldn't really argue with that. The royal annals from the House of Records were brought forth with much care they were read. On and on to the first royal couple, uh, there were three sons and no, no daughters born to them. The firstborn was Anki. He died on the throne and had no offspring. The middle son in his steed was uh, Anib, and Shargal was his firstborn, and to the throne he ascended after him. On the throne of kingship by the firstborn did not continue. So it didn't continue on that far. And this goes on and on and on. They're talking about blah, blah. Is he, you know, they're trying to figure out, is he, does he have the right to be king? You know, is he a usurper, this, that, and the other? Secession must be reconsidered to the assembly, he said, through neither firstborn nor by the queen of a son of pure seed am I descended. The essence of on in me is preserved by no concubine diluted. So he's saying, you know, yeah, basically, yes, she had, you know, on had, the, 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 my father had sex with, you know, a person who wasn't of the bloodline, but it didn't dilute it. You know, I'm still part of the, he's trying to just convince these people that he is one of them through the bloodline so that he can, you know, maintain power. They asked for his name. It is Anu. After my forefather, I named. Now, what's interesting about that? Wow. So this is this is the story of Anu. So the guy who took over and usurped the throne was Anu, and we know that Anu's sons later on were Enlil and Enki. So Enlil and Enki, who allegedly caused all this havoc on Earth the flood and genetic manipulation and all this stuff and seeding mankind with these phony religions were the result of, of, of someone who may or may not have actually been a part of the royal bloodline. So if that's true, and these people that are in charge and power today and presidents, kings, queens, power structure all over the world that are part of this bloodline, and they're basing their whole divine right to rule on the fact that they're a part of these bloodlines, right? If that's true, then that would make them imposters. That would make them these, because from what this is, from what this genealogical and historical record of the ancestors of the Anunnaki tells us, is that it wasn't the, the people who had been in the bloodlines and in the power structure and everything up to that point, who made the decision to earth? They seem to, to act like that was taboo. Then this guy comes in, kills the king, takes over, and then goes through this big, you know, long, drawn-out ordeal of being in front of the council and show, oh, look at me, and, and you know, and I came from this bloodline, and, my, you know, my, my, my baby daddy was over here, and, you know, he fucked this, this whore, the concubine, and, just because she's a whore doesn't mean I'm not a part of the bloodline. All this convincing going on, you see? So, again, that would make this very, very interesting. That would, that would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the, 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 these people that, oh, maybe that's what's going to happen. Maybe that's why they've been creating space-based weapons. Maybe, you know, they're scared because if there's something to this, if this is real, then that would mean that at some point the real bloodlines of power, if any of these people still exist anywhere, could actually feasibly come back and call out the power structure here on Earth as being the usurpers and the descendants of the usurper who took over the throne on Nibiru. They could very well come here and say, you know, we need help fixing our, our atmosphere, but, you know, they came down here and set this up and, 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 and basically did it against our wishes. Boy, that could be. No wonder they don't want us knowing what this information is. My goodness, see, it just becomes more clear every time we read it. My, they asked him what his name was, and he said, my name is Anu after my forefather. I am named. They inquired about his generations of On's three sons. He reminded them. Anki was the firstborn. Without a son or daughter, he died. Anib 
was the middle son instead of Anki to the throne he descended. And Neve, the daughter of his younger brother, took to be wife from them onward to the succession in the annals was, it was recorded. Who was that younger brother? A son of An and Antu that was of purest seed. The councils, counselors looked with wonderment at each other. Inuru was his name. I knew to them announced that he was my great ancestor. His spouse, Ninu, Ninuru, was a half-sister. Her son was first born. Inama was his name. And uh, from the throne ship, we were removed. From An's pure seed, we were not removed. So they basically at some point took out someone who had the right to be in power and tried to say that they, they weren't a part of the bloodline when they were. Okay. Though by different offsprings of one ancestor, we were both descended. Let us live in peace together and return abundance to Nibiru. Let me keep the throne. Let you keep the secession. Meaning, you know, all right, well, let's do it like this. You let me stay in charge and have power and get some stuff done. And when I'm done and I'm old and I die, I'll pass it on to you. And then your bloodline can keep it going after that. Nice little compromise to keep everybody happy, huh? To the council words he directed, let Anu the crown prince be. Let him be my successor. Let his son, my daughter, espouse. Let secession be united. Anu bowed before the council, and to the assembly he declared, Alalu's cupbearer I shall be. His successor in waiting, a son of mine, a daughter of his, as bride, I shall choose. That was the council's decision, and in the royal annals it was inscribed. In this manner, Alalu on the throne remained seated. He summoned the sages, the savants, and the commanders for him to consult in deciding that, and from that, he gained much knowledge. Let celestial boats be constructed to seek the gold and the hammered bracelet, he decided. So again, he usurps the crown, takes over, convinces them, hey, you know, you let me get in here and do get some stuff done, and then I'll make sure when I'm done that, you know, we'll still continue the bloodline thing and pass down the power. And so what is the first thing he decides to do? Let's build the celestial boats. Let's build the crafts. Let's go to the hammered bracelet, the area around the earth, and let's get the gold and bring it back here and fix our atmosphere. And uh, their first try um, was essentially uh, no good. By the hammered bracelets, the boats were crushed. None of them returned. Let the weapons of terror enter the bowels of Nibiru. Let Nibiru be cut open. Let the volcanoes again erupt, he then commanded. So this asshole tries to, you know, build these ships to go and get the gold it fails they 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 are destroyed and then he gets pissed off and unleashes you know weather weapons and says let the volcanoes erupt unleashes nuclear weapons with weapons of terror skyborne chariots were armed with terror missiles from the skies where the volcano struck oh so he sent up the the ships and launched nuclear weapons inside of the volcanoes of Nibiru. The mountains swayed, the valley shuddered as great brilliances with thunder exploded. In the land, there was much rejoicing. Everybody was expecting there was going to be an abundance of food and things were going to get better. And uh, it just continued to get worse. The volcanoes did not increase, the atmosphere did not heal. And uh, it kept going around its orbit, and uh, it kept getting colder and colder on the beer route. Of rocks and boulders was it together hammered. Like orphans with no mother, they banded together, surging back and forth a bygone destiny they followed. Their doings were loathsome, troubling uh, their ways. Nibiru's probing chariots like praying lions they devoured. So... Something uh, basically, you know, devoured these spaceships. 
the precious gold needed for surviving, they refused to dislodge. The chariot of Alalu toward the hammered bracelet was headlong moving. The ferocious builders in close combat to boldly face. There was definitely a, a fight going on here. Alalu, the firestones in his chariot more strongly stirred up. That which shows the way with steady hands he directed. The ominous boulders against the chariot charged forward like an enemy in, in battle attacking. Toward them, Alalu uh, shot a death-dealing missile from his spaceship. That's literally what it says. This is towards them, Alalu, a death-dealing missile from the chariot let loose. So he shot a, you know, he shot a missile out of a spaceship. Then another and another against the enemy. The terror weapons he thrust. So he's shooting nukes. This is great. You know, how come nobody's made a sci-fi movie out of this shit yet? Somebody will now that I've said it. Make billions of dollars, and I wish I would have done it. <laughs> that always happens to me. As frightened warriors, the boulders turned back a path for Alalu granting. Like by a spell, the hammered bracelet, a doorway to the king, it opened. That sounds like a stargate. So a stargate opened. In the dark deepness, Alalu, the heavens, he could uh, clearly see. By the bracelet's ferocity, he was not defeated. His mission was not ended. In the, in the distance, the sun's fiery ball was sending forth its brilliance, welcoming rays towards Alalu it was emitting. Before it was a red-brown planet on its orbit, the six and count of celestial gods it was. Alalu could but glimpse it. On its destined course from Alalu's path, it was quickly moving. Then snow-hued earth appeared, the seventh in the celestial count. So he's getting, you know, he blows up and blows this stuff out of the, out of the way, the people that are chasing him. And then, uh, so as he's, so they're chasing him from Nibiru. He shoots these nuclear weapons, blows them up, and, and starts making his way towards earth, presumably to come down and see this with culture and information and religion and, to call himself a god and everything else. Toward the planet, planet, Alalu set his course to a destination most inviting. Smaller than Nibiru was its alluring ball. Weaker than Nibiru was its attracting net, its gravity. Its atmosphere thinner, it was thinner than Nibiru's, and its clouds were within it, were within it swirling. Below the earth to three regions was divided, snow white at the top and on the bottom, blue and brown in between. Deftly, Alalu spread the chariot's arresting wings around the Earth's ball to circle. Again, you know, let's keep in mind this stuff came out of Sumerian clay tablets. Do you think these people could have just made up perfect descriptions of the Earth? <laughs> it just boggles my mind to people that say that this, uh, this is hogwash or whatever. I and mean, that's, that, that, you know, 5,000-year-old text, how can you explain that? In the middle region, dry lands and watery oceans he could discern. The beam that penetrates downward he directed, Earth's innards to detect. I have attained it, he ecstatically shouted. So right there he tells you he had a beam that he could shoot down to Earth and determine how much gold was there. Well, that's high technology. I have attained it, ecstatically, he shouted. Gold, much gold. The beam has indicated it was beneath the dark-hued region in the waters it was, too. With pounding heart, Alalu's uh, a decision was contemplating. Shall he on the dry land his chariot bring down pensions to crash and die? Perchance to crash and die, so, you know, would he, will he land on, on land, or shall he uh, you know, land on the water and, and, and risk sinking? Which way shall he survive? Will he the treasured gold discover? In the eagle seat, Alalu was not stirring. To fate's hands, the chariot he entrusted. Fully caught in Earth's attracting net, the chariot was moving faster. Its spread wings became a glow. Earth, oh, its spread wings became a glow? Was this motherfucker landing in a Klingon bird of prey or something? Jesus Christ. Is that where the fuck they got that at, too? Wouldn't surprise me. Von Braun's Nazis were in on the science advisory board on the on the original Star Trek series. Fact. It spread its wings. It spread wings became a glow. He's landing in a bird ship. 
a fucking Klingon bird of prey. Fit Jesus Christ, the Anunnaki are Klingons. Great. No wonder they're dumbasses. Klingons are fucking dumb. Earth's atmosphere was like an oven. Well, yeah, you come in through the atmosphere, you start heating up, motherfucker. Guess you weren't smart enough to know that in advance, were you? I guess you didn't have a, a nifty little laser beam you could shoot down here to figure that out, now did you? Then the chariot shook, emidifying a mortifying thunder. With abruptness, the chariot crashed, and with a suddenness altogether stopping. Senseless from the shaking and stunned by the crash, Alalu wasn't moving. Then he opened his eyes and knew he was among the living. At the planet of gold, he victoriously arrived. Now, this is an account, the account of the earth and its gold. It is an account of the beginning and how the celestial gods were created. In the beginning, when in the above, the gods in the heavens had not been called into being. And in the below, key, the firm ground, had not yet been named. Alone in the void, there existed Apsu, the primordial begetter. In the heights of the above, the celestial gods had not yet been created. So, see, they had, he, that's exactly. Celestial gods, the ones that were the hierarchy that, that was the bloodlines on the Biru that we talked about earlier, that had that geneal genealogical record, those are the ones that became the gods. Above and below, the gods had not yet been formed. Destinies were not yet decreed. No reed had yet been formed. No marshland had appeared. Alone did Apsu reign the, in the void. Then by his winds, the primordial waters were mingled. A divine and artful spell Apsu upon the waters cast. On the void's deep, he, pour, he poured a sound sleep. Tiamat, the mother of all, as a spouse for himself, he fashioned. A celestial mother, a watery beauty, he was indeed. Uh, a, a watery beauty, she was indeed. Now, Tiamat is said to be this, the mother of all, which is, is supposed to be this other planet that was once in our solar system that was a water planet that looked like a second sun from Earth because of, of the way the sun reflected off the water on the planet. Beside him, Apsu, little Mumu, then brought forth, as his messenger he him appointed, a gift for Tiamat to present. A gift resplendent to his spouse, Apsu, granted, a shining metal, the everlasting gold for her alone to possess. Then it was that the two, their waters mingled, divine, oh, their waters mingled, yeah. You know what it says when, when their waters mingled, right? And yeah, like Jesus turning the water into wine. And how Jesus turned the water into wine, he shot a fat load right in some girl's mouth. Divine children, yeah, really. That's what the water was, the magic water you told them to drink for. Yeah, man, it was, it was semen. A bunch of semen worshipers. <laughs> uh, male and female were the celestials created, Lamu and Lahamu by the names they were called. In the below did Apsu and Tiamat make them an abode. Before then, had they had grown in age and in stature, and the waters above Anshar and Kishar were formed. Surpassing their brothers in size, they were. As a celestial couple, the two were fashioned. So hear, hear, what, they're, hear what they're saying here. They're talking about forming these celestial. They're, 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 they're talking about, he's talking about forming moons and forming things like of that nature, and planets. In order for life to be able to flourish on Earth, because if we didn't have a moon, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have any, any sort of tides or any ability for uh, life to be created. A son on in the distant heavens was their heir. Then on to to be his spouse and as on's equal was brought forth as a boundary of the upper waters their abode was made. Thus were three heavenly couples below and above in the depths created by names that were called the family of Apsu with Mumu and Tiamat they formed. At that time, Nibiru had not yet been seen. The earth was not yet called into being. Mingled were the heavenly waters by a hammered bracelet. They were not yet separated. At that time, circuits were not yet fully fashioned. Oh, so that even, okay, well, that's interesting. That tells you right there. They're talking about forming planetary systems. I've, I've talked about this and speculated about this for a long time. 
that I believe that at some point during one of these cataclysms, the earth was, was re-terraformed. I think that's what these, these guys have been doing. They've been going around terraforming planets forever. And that's kind of what it's talking about here. I mean, it is what it's talking about here. I mean, it says at that time, the circuits were not yet fully fashioned. Well, the circuits, we know, they're referring to orbits. So that's an admission that they had the technology to be able to create orbits for particular planets. I mean, that's, that's insane. Their celestial kinfolk banded together, erratic were their ways. Their ways to Apsu were very loathsome. Tiamat, getting no rest, was aggravated and raged. A throng to march by her side she formed, a growing raging host against the sons of Apsu she brought forth. With eleven of this kind she brought forth, she made the firstborn born Kingu, chief among them. When the celestial gods of this herd uh, did hear for counsel, they rallied. Kingu she has elevated to rank as on command to, sh to him she gave. A tablet of destiny to his chest she has attached, his own orbit to acquire. To battle against the gods of her offspring, Kingu, she instructed, who will stand up to Tiamat, the gods asked each other. Now, this is, this is crazy, because this is turning into this, the, 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 this like sort of mythological story of, of, of these planets, you know, in our solar system battling each other. That's just bizarre. So who shall stand up to, to Tiamat? So let me guess. Somebody's going to defeat Tiamat. And then when they defeat Tiamat, that's what's going to cause the asteroid belt to form. It's going to cause all the water to rush to Earth. And then that's what they're going to refer to in the book of Genesis as the waters above the firmament, right? Let me guess. <laughs> Watch, whatever happens, Tiamat's going to be defeated. And that's what that's symbolic of. None in their orbit stepped forward. None a weapon for battle would bear. At that time, in the heart of the deep, a god was engendered. In a chamber of fates, a place of destinies, he was born. By an artful creator was he fashioned. The son of his own son he was. From the deep where he was engendered, the god from his family in a rushing departed. A gift to his creator, the seed of life he carried with him. To the void, he set his course, a new destiny he was seeking. The first to glimpse the wandering celestial was the ever-watchful Antu. Alluring with his figure, a radiance he was beaming. Lordly was his gait, G-A-I-T, gait. Exceedingly great was his course. Of all the gods, he was the loftiest, surpassing their orbit he was. The first to glimpse him was Antu, her breast by child never sucked. Her breast by child never sucked. I bet there's an anagram in there, Alice. Come be my son, she called to him. Let me your mother become. She cast her net and made him welcome and made his course for the purpose suited. Oh, whoa, a nice orbit pulling in, uh, in something in the orbit there. <coughs> her words filled the newcomer's heart with pride. The one who would nurse him made him haughty. His head to double size grew larger. Four members at his side he sprouted, and his lips, uh, his, he moved his lips in acceptance, a godly fire from them blazed forth. See, this is talking about, you know, probably Jupiter forming. Toward Anne to his course he turned, his face to Anne soon to show. When Anne, or On, saw him, my son, my son, with exaltation he shouted, to leadership you shall be consigned. A host by your side will be your servants. Let Nibiru be your name, as crossing forever known. He bowed to Nibiru, turning his face at Nibiru's passage. He spread his net for Nibiru, four servants he brought forth. So this is saying that the gods themselves are the planets, and the planets themselves are the gods. As in they are conscious, and, the, and each of the planets are actually living entities that are conscious. Well, that's, that would have unbelievable implications for, for our planet and all planets, wouldn't it? But that's what they're saying here. His host by his side to be the south wind, the north wind, the fast wind, and the west wind. With joyful heart on to Anshar, his forebearer, the arrival of Nibiru announced. Anshar, upon hearing this, 
Gaga, who was by his side as an emissary, sent forth words of wisdom to On to deliver to task Nibiru to assign. He charged Gaga, which I believe is Venus, to give voice to what was in his heart, to On thus say, Tiamat, she who bore us now detests us. She has set up a warring host. She is furious with rage. Against the gods, her children, 11 warriors, march by her side. Kingu, among them, she elevated. A destiny to his chest she attached without right. No god among us against her venom can stand up. Her host in all of us has established fear. Let Nibiru become our avenger. Let him vanquish Tiamat. Let him save our lives. For him to decree a fate, let him go forth and face our mighty foe. To On, Gaga departed. He bowed before him the words of Anshar, he repeated. On to Nibiru's forebearers, words repeated Gaga's message to him, he revealed. To the words, Nibiru with wonder listened. Of the mother who would her children devour with fascination, he heard. His heart, without saying, to set out against Tiamat, he had already prompted. He opened his mouth to On, and Gaga said, if indeed I am to vanquish Tiamat to save your lives, then convene the gods to assembly and proclaim my destiny to be supreme. Let all the gods agree in council to make me the leader and bow to my command. When Lamu and Lahamu heard this, they cried out with anguish. Strange was the demand, its meaning cannot be fathomed. Thus they said, the gods who decree the fates with each other consulted, to make Nibiru their avenger, they all agreed to him an exalted fate decree. From this day on, unchallengeable shall be your commandments. To him, they said, no one among us gods shall transgress your bounds. And uh, we're about to pick up, it's about to uh, get into the celestial battle. So I'm going to read this little bit and stop before it gets to the celestial battle. Go, Nibiru, be our avenger. They fashioned him for him a princely circuit towards Tiamat, a, a uh, orbit. They gave Nibiru blessings. They gave Nibiru awesome weapons. Anshar, three more winds of Nibiru brought forth, the evil wind, the whirlwind, and the matchless wind. Kishar, with a blazing flame, filled his body and net to enfold Tiamat there within. Thus, ready for battle, Nibiru toward Tiamat directly set his course. So this is talking about this, you know, the battle of the gods and the gods being planets and, and, and what led to that. So we know, as we already know, that Tiamat is going to be destroyed. That becomes the asteroid belt. The water comes rushing down to Earth, uh, covering much of the land on Earth with water. It was already covered with a great deal of water, but that's where the rest of it came in. And that would lead us to the next timeline of uh, them starting to use genetic manipulation and start to use mankind as a slave race. This is fascinating stuff. Um, it's one thing to, you know, already have an, uh, a, a, an idea of this stuff being there, but, uh, man, oh, man, it's totally different when you really start to look at it in this way. And I'm glad we're reading this. And I'm glad we're starting to get some information on some of these, you know, anagrams and stuff too, wild stuff there. Now, this is the account of the celestial battle. We have the lead up to that last night, so tonight we're going to actually have the battle. And how the earth led came to be and of Nibiru's destiny. The Lord went forth, his fated course he followed. Toward the raging Tiamat, he set his face, a spell with his lips he uttered. So, this is interesting that these people, you know, they seem to be, you know, these gods are using spells and they're using magic. And uh, Tiamat, of course, we know this is the battle of the, the, the planets, the account of the celestial battle, meaning the battle of the planets. And Inky talks about these, these planets being gods, which is funny. Yeah, somebody was talking about that, that email we got from some crack nut a few months ago saying, all the planets are Satan. Oh, my God. Son of Satan's cock, bitch. Oh, my goodness. Um, and so um, 
again, you know, this is keep bear, bear in mind what we're talking about here in this segment that this is a supposedly a planetary battle between gods, the, the plants themselves being gods and, and battling. And of course, we know what the outcome that's going to be this, the, the destruction of Tiamat, which was allegedly this water planet that, when viewed from Earth, made it appear from Earth that there were two suns because it was a water planet and the sun shining on it would made it reflect. So it looked like a, a second sun. And supposedly, it was blown up. The uh, pieces of it became the asteroid belt, and all the water came rushing down to Earth, call, causing the Great Deluge. And uh, so this is, this is essentially what, uh, what this is going to be talking about right here. Toward the raging Tiamat, he had set his face, a spell with his lips he uttered. As a cloak for protection, he, the pulsar, and the emitter put on. Pulsar and emitter, so that's like, a, I mean... <laughs> Well, this sounds like high technology, doesn't it? I mean, again, you, you have to understand that, that you know this is this is talking about very, very advanced technology, advanced beyond what we even have right now uh, in 2011, way, way beyond that. With a fearsome radiance, his head was crowned. On his right, he posted the smiter. On his left, the repeller he placed. He's, you know, some sort of laser weapons, it sounds like. This is just insane. The seven winds, his host of helpers, like a storm he sent forth, Toward the raging Tiamat, he was rushing, clamoring for battle. The gods thronged about him. Then from his path, they departed. To scan Tiamat and her helpers alone, he was advancing. The scheme of Kingu, her host commander, to conceive. When he saw vigilant Kingdu, his vision became blurred. As he gazed upon the, in the direction of the monsters, he was distracted. And uh, he got off course, and he was confused. Tiamat's band uh, tightly encircled her. With terror, they trembled. Tiamat gave a shudder to her roots and a mighty roar she emitted. On Nibiru, she cast a spell and engulfed him with her charms. The issue between them was joined. The battle was unavoided. Face to face they came, Tiamat and Nibiru against each other. They were advancing. They approached for battle, and they pressed on for single combat meaning one-on-one, man-on-man. The Lord spread his net to encompass her. He cast it. With fury, Tiamat cried out like one possessed. She lost her senses. The evil wind which had been behind him, Nibiru drove forward. In her face, he let it loose. Did, I mean, we, we, I'm not trying to be sexual, dirty, or be vulgar here, but I mean, you know what that kind of you know what that sounds like, right? He drove forward and let it loose in her face. I mean, you know, I don't think it's very hard to figure that out. I mean, you know, he shot a load. I mean, I don't know what else to say. She opened her mouth, the evil wind to swallow, but could not close her lips. Oh, I'm sorry. The evil wind charged her belly into her innards. It made its way. Yeah, I mean, this is yeah, this is totally what this is. The meaning, okay. I'm, <laughs> wow. So this is the ejaculation of the gods into the to the mouths of the god. This is yeah. You know, this is dirty, man. This is triple X. The FCC would have a major problem with this if this was on terrestrial radio. Nibiru drew forward. Nibiru drove forward. In her face, he let it loose. She opened her mouth, the evil wind to swallow, but could not close her lips. The evil wind charged her belly into her innards and made its way. Her innards were howling. Her body was distended. Her mouth was wide open. Through the opening, Nibiru shot a brilliant arrow, a lightning most divine. It pierced her innards, her belly it tore apart. It tore into her womb and it split apart her heart. Oh, this is good stuff. Mm -hmm. Satan wants to you know, come in every now and again. Having thus subdued her, her life breath he extinguished. The lifeless body surveyed like a slaughtered carcass Tiamat now was. Beside their lifeless mistress, her eleven helpers trembled with terror. In Nibiru's net, they were captured, unable to flee. 
Kingu, who by Tiamat was made the host chief, was among them. The Lord put him into fetters to his lifeless mistress. He bound him. He wrestled from Kingu. The tablets of destiny's unright. Well, that would mean that. Oh, that would mean that he made uh, Tiamat be in orbit. It didn't get destroyed. Oh, that's all. That's kind of odd. I stamped it with his own seal and fastened the destiny to his own chest. The others of Tiamat's band, as captives, he bound in his in his orbit. He ensnared them. So he's making them his planets by ensnaring them in his orbit. He trampled them underfoot and cut them up into pieces. He bound them all to his orbit to turn around them he made and, 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 and to rotate backwards in course, so he made them have a reverse orbit. From the battle of Nibiru then departed to the gods who had appointed the victory to announce, he made a uh, orbit around Apsu to Kishar and Anshar, he journeyed ahead. Gaga came out to greet him as a herald to the others he journeyed. Beyond An and Antu, Nibiru to the abode in the deep he proceeded. The fate of lifeless Tiamat and of Kingu he then considered. To Tiamat, whom he had subdued, the Lord Nibiru then returned. He made his way to her, paused to view her lifeless body, and to artfully divide the monster in his heart that was planning something. Then, as a muscle into two parts, he split her. Her chest from her lower parts, he separated. Her innards, her inner channels, he cut apart. Her golden veins, he beheld with wonder. Trotting upon her hinder part, the Lord, her uppermost part completely severed. The north wind, his helper from his side, he summoned. To thrust away the severed head, the wind he commanded to the void, in the void to place it. Nibiru wind upon Tiamat then hovered, sweeping upon her gushing waters. Nibiru shot a lightning. To north wind he gave a signal. In a brilliance was Tiamat's upper part to a region unknown carried. With her then bound, Kingu was also exiled. Of the severed part, a companion to be. The hinder part fate Nibiru then considered. As an everlasting trophy of the battle he wished it to be, a constant reminder in the heavens the place of the battle to, to enshrine. With his mace, the hinder part, he smashed to bits and pieces, then strung them together as a band to form a hammered bracelet. So was that Saturn? Locking them together, as a watchman, no, that's the asteroid belt. The hammered bracelet is the asteroid belt. Locking them together as a watchman, he stationed them, a firmament to divide the waters from the waters. Yeah, waters above the firmament. That's what they're talking about in the book of Genesis. The destruction of Tiamat. The upper waters above the firmament, from the waters below it, he separated. Artful works Nibiru thus fashioned. The Lord then crossed the heavens to survey the regions. From Apsu's quarter to the abode of Gaga, he measured the dimensions. The edge of the deep Nibiru then examined towards his birthplace, he cast his gaze. He paused and hesitated then to the firmament, the place of the battle. Slowly he returned. Passing again to Apsu's region of the sun, missing his spouse uh, that he thought about with remorse, he missed her because she was dead. He gazed upon Tiamat's wounded half to her upper part, he gave attention. The waters of life, her bounty from the wounds, were still pouring. Her golden veins, Apsu's rays, were reflecting. The seed of life, his creator's legacy, Nibiru then remembered. When he trod on Tiamat, when he split her asunder, to her the seed he surely imparted. He addressed words to Apsu, to him saying, With your warming rays to the wounds, give healing. Let the broken part new life be given in your family as a daughter to be. Let the waters to be to one place be gathered. Let firm land appear. This is when they're transferring the water to earth, folks. That's what this is. By firm land, let her be called Key. Henceforth, her name to be in Key before it was named earth was called Key, K-I. Apsu to the words of Nibiru gave heed. Let the earth join my family. Key, firm land of the below. 
Let earth her name be henceforth. By her turning, let there be day and night. In the days my healing rays to her I shall provide. Let Kingo be a creature of the night to shine at night. I shall appoint him. So Kingu became the moon. Earth's companion, the moon forever to be. Which is just odd considering, you know, our moon is, seems to be an artificial construct. I mean, it seems, you know, it's, doesn't orbit, it orbits us in a geosynchronous pattern like a satellite. Not like an orbit of a moon. That's what's very odd about it. Nibiru, the words of Apsu with satisfaction, heard. He crossed the heavens and surveyed the regions. To the gods whom had elevated him, he granted permanent stations. Their circuits he destined that none shall transgress nor fall short of each other. He strengthened the heavenly, heavenly locks, gates on both sides he established. An outermost abode he chose for himself beyond Gaga were its dimensions. The great circuit or the great orbit to be his destiny, he beseeched Apsu for him to decree. All of the gods spoke up from their stations. Let Nibiru's sovereignty be surpassing. Most radiant of the gods he is. Let him truly the son of the sun be. From his quarter, Apsu gave his blessing. Nibiru shall hold the crossing of heaven and earth. Crossing shall be his name. The gods shall cross over neither above nor below. He shall hold the central position, the shepherd of the gods he shall be. A shar, or a, a, a type of a way of measuring time, a shar shall be his, his orbit, that his destiny will, for be, will forever be. Now, this is the account of how the olden times began, and of the era that in the annals of the golden era, by the name it was known, and how from Nibiru to Earth, the missions went the gold to uh, the, the missions to Earth to obtain gold uh, happened. The escape from Alalu from Nibiru was its beginning. With great understanding, was Alalu endowed. Much knowledge uh, he had, he had learned. He learned much knowledge by his forefather and Shargal of the heavens and the orbits on the orbits. Much knowledge was amassed. By Inchar was acknowledged greatly augmented. Of that, Alalu made much learning with the sages he discoursed, savants, and commanders he consulted. Thus was the knowledge of the beginning ascertained uh, that Alalu had learned. The gold in the hammered bracelet was the confirmation. The gold in the hammered bracelet of, of gold in Tiamat's upper half was the indication. At the planet of gold, Alalu victoriously arrived in a, chair, a high chariot with thunder crashing. So, you know, a loud spaceship comes crashing down. With a beam, he scanned the place, his whereabouts to discover. So, he, <laughs> there again, you know, he, uh, Lalu comes down in his ship, his UFO scans a beam down, and then decides that where, he, where he's going to land. The same thing that, that he did before when he decided there was gold there. He shot a beam down. I mean, this is amazing stuff here. 5,000-year-old text. Talking about UFOs and shooting beams down. Crazy shit. High chariot on dry land descended at the edge of extended marshes. It landed. He put on an eagle's helmet, and he put on a fish's suit. So he put on a, an eagle's helmet. That's funny. Okay. And a fish's So he put on something where he could swim into the water. The chariot's hatch he opened at the, at the hatch. He stopped to wonder. Dark hued was the ground. Blue white were the skies. No sound there, no one to bid him welcome. Alone on an alien planet he stood, perchance from Nibiru forever exiled. To the ground himself he lowered, on the dark-hued soil he stepped. There were hills in the distance, nearby much vegetation there was. Ahead of him there were marshes, into the marsh he stepped. By the water's coolness he shuddered. Back to the dry ground he stepped. Alone on an alien planet, he stood. With thoughts, he was possessed of his wife and his offspring, and with longing, he remembered them. Was he forever ever exiled from Nibiru? Of that, again and again, he often wondered. 
to the chariot or the spaceship, the UFO, he soon returned with food and drink to be sustained. Then deep sleep overcame him, a very powerful slumber. How long he slept, he could not remember. What awakened him, he could not tell. A brightness there was outside, a brilliance on the biru unseen, the sun. A pole from a chariot he extended with a tester it was equipped. It breathed the planet's air, compatibility it indicated. The chariot's hatch he opened, at the open hatch he took a breath. Another breath, then another, the air of key indeed was completely compatible with Nibiru's. Alalu clapped his hands, a song of joy he was singing. Without an eagle's helmet, without a fish's suit, to the ground himself he lowered. The brightness outside was blinding. The rays of the sun were overpowering. Into the chariot he returned, a mask for the eyes he donned. He went and got his ass some sunglasses. Good call. Glad you had those with you. Smart thinking. Always carry sunglasses when you go to an alien planet. Okay? Put that on the fucking board. Always carry fucking sunglasses when you go to an alien planet. Smart move. I'm glad we had some sensible people in our ancestry here. <laughs> Uh, he picked up a weapon that he, ca he he carried with him, and he picked up a handy sampler. What's a handy sampler? Got a little bit of everything in there. Oh, I got a gun. I got me a laser beam. I got me a tractor beam. I got all kinds of stuff in here, man. To the ground, he himself lie lowered on the dark-hued soil he stepped. He made his way towards the marshes. Dark green were the waters. By the marsh's edge, there were pebbles. Alalu picked up a pedal and thrust it into the marsh. In the marsh, a moving his eyes glimpsed. The waters were filled with fishes. Into the marsh, the sampler he lowered and uh, looked at the, at the murky waters. Uh, for drinking the water, it was not fit. Alalo was greatly disappointed. He turned away from the marshes in the direction of the hills he went. He made his way through the vegetation. Bushes gave way to trees. This place was like an orchard. The trees with fruits were laden with fruits. By their sweet smell, they enticed him, and, and Alalu picked a fruit and put it in his mouth. Uh, it was smelled very sweet and tasted very sweet, and he was greatly delighted. Away from the sun's rays, Alalu was walking toward the hills. He set his direction. Among the trees, a wetness under his feet, he sensed, a sign of close-by waters. In the direction of the wetness, he set his course. In the midst of the forest, there was a pond, a pool of silent waters. Into the pond, the sampler he lowered. For drinking, the water was good. Alalu laughed, and unstopping laughter seized him. The air was good. The water was drinking uh, was fit for drinking. There was fruit. There were fishes. What more did he need, right? Well, let me go find something I can bang, and we'll be all set. You know, I got food. I got fucking water. I can breathe air. Now I need something to put my dick in. So, you know, that's pretty much where we're going next. Got to be. Uh, he's a man, right? He's got his food. He's got his shelter. What's he need next? He needs vagina. And uh, boom, here you go. That's how the human race got here. The end. Thank you very much. Have a good night. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> boom, that brings us up to date. That's how we got here. Some dude, you know, with a big ego, crashed on an alien planet, found some food, found some shelter, found breathable air, found something to fuck, and Bam. This is how life was created. I don't know, we'll just walk into a classroom and teach that, you know. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, kids. Here we go. We're going to learn about uh, creation and evolution today. Here's how it happened. 5,000 years ago, uh, an alien, uh, drunk-ass, horny, uh, egotistical, egotistical alien crashed on Earth. He missed his wife and, and, and his kids. Mostly he missed his wife because he couldn't get any poontang. And, uh, you know, he found some fucking fruits and berries and some water and some wreath wear. I was like, oh, this is badass. Now I got to get my dick wet. And uh, that about brings us up to date, kids. We'll have a quiz on this on Friday. Be sure and tell your parents what we learned today, okay? You guys, be safe. Thanks. So, yeah, this guy's like, you know, living it up. Now I got to go. I just need to have something, find something to have sex with. The daughters of man. 
That's what he's going to have sex with. Yes. With eagerness, Alalu bent down together. He cupped his hands and put the water in his mouth. It had a different taste from the water of Nibiru. Once more, he drank, and then with fright, he jumped. A hissing sound he could hear. A slithering body by the poolside. That was a fucking snake, dude. We got snakes down here on this planet. All that technology and laser beams and, you know, shooting beams down to see where the gold is and shooting beams down to see where the optimum landing spot is. All that fucking technology couldn't save you from a fucking water snake. Now, could it? I mean, you know, that, that, that really, well, it's, it's funny because that's what, uh, you know, that sort of seems like what the elite do, what the New World Order does. That, it's that kind of shit, you know? You guys can pull off all these operations, but you, you know, you ain't a fucking brain between you. It's just, <laughs> didn't count on that fucking snake, did you, Bubba? Uh, he seized the weapon that he carried and uh, blasted away. Uh, uh, oh, you pussy. Shot the snake with a fucking laser beam. The moving stopped. The hissing was ended. To examine the danger, Lalu stepped forward. The slithered body lay still. Dead was the creature, a sight most strange, like a rope its long body was, without hands or feet. Fierce eyes were in its small head. Out of its mouth, a much long, a long tongue was sticking. It fucking snake, dude. A sight on Nibiru never beheld it was, a creature of another world. Was it the orchid's guardian? Alalu by himself pondered. Was it the water's master himself, he asked. In his carried flask, he collected some water and made his way back to his uh, flying saucer. The sweet fruits he also picked and uh, took them back to the flying saucer as well. The brightness of the sun's rays were greatly diminished. Darkness uh, it was. Uh, so he crashed out in the UFO. The shortness of the day, Alalu pondered. Its shortness amazed him. So not used to our orbit. So the days are much shorter. So you age a lot quicker. From the direction of the marshes, a cool lightness on the horizon was rising. A white-hued ball in the heavens was rising. Kingu, the Earth's companion, he now beheld. What in the accounts of the beginning, his eyes, the truth could now see? The planets and their orbits, the hammered bracelet, key, the Earth, Kingu, its moon, were all created all by names that were called, uh, names were called. In his heart, Alalu knew one more truth that needed beholding. The gold, the means of their salvation, needed to be found. If truth be in the beginning tales, if by the waters the golden veins of Tiamat were washed, in the waters of Ki it's cut off half, gold must be found. So part, so what, so essentially what, now I understand what they were saying. Earth, Ki was actually a part of Tiamat. Cut that was cut off from. Very interesting. You often you, that's not really what you hear oftentimes in, in the research community and stuff. Very very interesting stuff. With hands unsteady, Alalu the tester uh, dismantled the chariot's pole. With trembling hands, he donned the fish suit. The fast arriving daylight eagerly awaited him. He left the chariot, the UFO, at daybreak and quickly stepped into the marshes. Into the deeper waters he waded, into the tester into the waters he inserted. Its illuminated face he eagerly watched. In his chest, his heart was pounding. I mean, it's funny, its illuminated face literally is describing this, you know, device having a screen on it. You gonna sit here and tell me somebody, some guy 5,000 years ago in Samaria just made that up? <laughs> I mean, it, if you don't believe anything else, I mean, the idea that he's, you know, looking at an, at an illuminated face of this tester, wondering what, you know, what it's going to tell him. I mean, that's a screen. How did that guy ascribe, know to describe a, a, a fucking LCD screen or a display screen 5,000 years ago? I mean, that question alone out of all, all of this should have everybody in the scientific community wondering what's going on here. It's illuminated phase he eagerly watched. In his chest, his heart was pounding. The water's contents was indicated by the tester, by symbols and numbers, its findings disclosed. So right there, he's looking at a screen. Then Alalu's heartbeat stopped. There is gold in the waters. 
the tester was telling him. Unsteady on his legs, Alalu stepped forward deeper into the marsh as he made his way. Again, the tester into the waters he, inter- he, he inserted, and again, the tester announced that he had found gold. A cry of triumph from Alalu's throat emanated. Nibiru's fate in his hands was now in his hands. He made his way back to the UFO. He took off the fish suit and, and occupied the commander's seat. The tablets of destinies that knows all orbits, he enlivened to Nibiru's orbit to find the direction. The speaker of words he stirred up toward Nibiru, the words to carry. Then to Nibiru words he uttered, thus he was saying, the words of the great Alalu to Anu on Nibiru are directed. On another world am I, the gold of salvation I have found. The fate of Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions, you must give heed. So, Right there, he's he's basically blackmailing them. He's saying, you know, I found it. I found the gold. I found what can save our planet. How badly do you want it? Because if you know, if if you want me to come back and save our planet, then you're going to have to, you know, when I come back and bring it, I'm king and I get to be in charge, and you know, because hey, I'm the one doing the hard work, all the work, right? So that's the uh, that's the end of the second tablet of the Lost Book of Enki, and um, tomorrow on the show we'll get into the third tablet. Well, the synopsis of the third tablet, which is coming up next, and then obviously the third tablet after that. So I, I guess next we're going to be getting into him finding you know the daughters of man and getting his you know getting his groove on and doing a little you know genetic crossbreeding to create slaves to hunt to mine the gold. Fascinating stuff here, uh, Lost Book of Enki. Again, you know. Uh, I don't always read everything that I read and all the stuff I, I always agree with. I'm not reading this because I endorse it or I agree with it. I'm just reading it because uh, it's highly interesting. And we are, I think, uh, by reading it like this and sort of dissecting it and going through it day, day by day and page by page, I think it gives us all, myself included, you, more of an opportunity for us to decide for ourselves what's bullshit and what's not instead of somebody just telling us, oh, you know, Zachariah Sitch and he's, you know, CIA. And yeah, he is. He was. Blah, blah, whatever, but still, let's decide that for ourselves. Let's go through this. Let's see if we can get anything out of it. We'll call what's bullshit bullshit, and we'll take the rest and go about our own merry way. We don't have to fucking bind anything or support, you know, this clown or his ideology, what he stood for, anything else. But the fact of the matter is there's some, the reason why we've been told not to look at this is because this is indeed what mankind is supposed to know, so we don't repeat those same vicious cycles. And with the knowledge of this stuff, mankind would know that this happened in the past and this is where we're heading. We would pull ourselves out of that before we had a chance. That's why they will not let us have this info. And that, again, is why the whole, uh, you know, operation of the phony control patriot movement, truth movement was set up. Because then when people start looking forward towards conspiratorial topics, they eventually get into this stuff. But that's why you hear Alex Jones, oh, folks, oh, that stuff's a distraction. Talk about the bankers, folks. Just quacking it up running block, being the cock block for the priest class. Keep on doing it, Bubba. You're, you, you know, people are awake now. A lot, people, a lot more people have figured this out, and uh, that, to me, like I talked about last night, that's the fight. You know, that's what we got to do. We got to continue trying to get this information out to people and let them know that what these elite and these priest class bozos are hiding at the very top is they're hiding our birthright. They're hiding our information. They're, they're you know, giving us these phony things like, you know, the phony state of Israel and, the, uh, you know, telling us that, these people over here are the Semites when it's not actually these the, them, and they're going to killing the other people that are actually the bloodline descendants of these uh, ancient civilizations. I mean, it's just insane. But it's all happening because of our sheer lack of knowledge of things that we've never been allowed to know. If we had a history of what had happened on on other planets where possibly our forebears came from, and that they they had gone down the same route we did, we might see that and go, "Oh man, they fucked up. We don't want to go that route. We got to change things." If we were to do that, there'd be no more New World Order. There'd be no more power structure. So, you see, this is this is why this is important. This is why I implore you to look at this information and, uh, as usual, decide about it for yourself. 